welcome everyone to our first cooking class of the semester, kind of put together by the Dickinson College Farm and some ingredients Professor Sue will be using are coming from the Dickinson College Farm. So uh, I have a short, short bio about Professor Sue. Um, Adrian Sue is a professor of creative writing and poet in residence at Dickinson College and has been a member of the College Farm CSA since its inception in 2009. I didn't fact check, but I, I, I believe you. Um, in addition to workshops uh, in poetry and fiction, she teaches a creative nonfiction course called Writing About Food. Her, first, her fifth book of poems, Peach State, out next month from the University of Pittsburgh Press, explores the transformation of her native Atlanta from the mid 20th century to today, from a Chinese American perspective with a focus on food. Uh, three poems from the book have been chosen for inclusion in uh, Best American Poetry, and Peach State has just received a starred review from Booklist. Uh, the dishes for uh, tonight's class are uncomplicated, allowing time for a few poems. So um, with that, I will put the link to both the book and the pre-order for the book and the um, recipe in the chat, and I'll pass it over to you, Professor Sue. Okay, thank you, Maddie. It's been, it's just been great working with you. And I think so many of us hardly see anybody, but it's nice. I get to see you when I pick up my Dickinson Farm winter produce. Uh, so um, I think some people, I, I put a, a little blurb on Facebook about this, but I'm just going to repeat what that says because I think some people signed up from the Dickinson side and not the Facebook side. I chose this. This, these two recipes, because they are so straightforward, um, I almost thought this isn't really a course, but there's lots to talk about along the way, just like ingredients, making your way through maybe um, an Asian grocery store a little bit. I mean, there's lots of stuff I don't know about in Asian grocery stores, but you're looking at you know 17 grams of sesame oil or something. Um, maybe I can help a little. Uh, one thing I really wanted to do with this uh, selection was to avoid the bane of Chinese recipes, which is that they almost always end in the command serve immediately. Uh, and that's related to all kinds of things. One of them, you may have heard the phrase breath of the walk, walk hey. Uh, which is just kind of a, a poetic way of saying eat it while it's hot, which is another thing you hope, hear people say in a Chinese context as well, eat it while it's hot. Uh, because the whole tradition of Chinese cooking has evolved to cope with fuel shortages. Um, one way to save cooking fuel, of course, is to cut your food up into really small pieces and then cook it really fast over a blast of high heat and then eat it before it gets cold. Um, so that's, I think, one of the reasons the recipes tend to be stir fries that end in that hated command. Um, we live in the real world. We just can't all have everybody poised and waiting to eat at the moment we have decided the food is ready. Uh, so I long wanted to, uh, write a cookbook that was like Chinese recipes that don't end and serve immediately, but it's been done. Um, and I think it would also be really hard because it, it's not really the norm uh, to avoid that. Um, let's see, I would, oh, the other thing about this recipe is that you don't have to have any specialized equipment. I'm just using a, a chef's knife and a a heavy pot, um, and that if you looked ahead of the recipe, you just you saw that you know the pot should be just about the right size to put the chicken in, uh, fairly snugly. I'm going to go ahead and start because there's so little to this <laughs> that it's uh, there, we'll be kind of waiting for things to come to a boil. Uh, but one thing to know is the recipe is written as if you don't have a master sauce already. I'm just assuming if you already have a master sauce, you probably have little reason to keep this. The concept of the master sauce is just that you keep on reusing the sauce. So if you're starting now, 
you will have a sauce after tonight that you can in theory use forever and pass on to your descendants uh, because you cook the chicken in the liquid and the liquid of course seasons the chicken but it also soaks up the flavor and essence of the chicken and you use some of that sauce for eating the chicken but you have a lot left over so you save the leftover and cook your next chicken in it and then every time you cook a chicken in that same sauce of course you have to replenish some of the ingredients it gets another uh kind of expansion of flavor from another chicken having been cooked it anybody who's made stock knows that in the more sort of bones and vegetables and things you put in it the more flavorful the stock so in a way you're kind of enriching a stock every time so it's not a stock um what i'm doing is the Part of the recipe that says if you already have a master sauce this is how you refresh it um, but what we're going to do is so easy that it doesn't matter whether you're doing what i'm doing or making your first sauce uh, so i will start by um just getting a couple of the aromatics ready which is pretty straightforward uh, i didn't know until recently that there was a a debate, kind of ongoing debate about how to peel ginger, that some people say absolutely you peel ginger with a spoon. And I grew up peeling ginger with a knife. Um, I've tried both and I found that if your ginger is thin skinned, the spoon is amazing. It just takes off the skin and you don't lose a lot of flesh. You know how you peel a potato and there's a lot of lost kind of potato <laughs> stuck to the skin. Um, I think it's the same. Thing here, the knife takes off more of the inside. But the ginger I happen to have is a little bit thicker skin, so I find it just easier to use the knife. So if you've got your ginger, um, you want probably about three slices. I want only one because I'm refreshing my sauce rather than starting one from scratch. So I have just and I don't know, I cut it maybe about an eighth of an inch thick, but it really doesn't matter for this recipe because you're not gonna eat the ginger. And then um, you just kind of give it a little snack um, with like the, the flat side of your knife or um, really sometimes I just hit it with whatever happens to be at hand. And then similar with the scallion, you don't eat it. So it doesn't matter what it looks like. You're just trying to get the uh, the flavor of it is just like putting an onion in your, in your stock. So similarly, I think I said in the recipe to, um, I can't even remember what I said to cut the scallion. It doesn't matter. Um, sometimes I just cut it so that it doesn't get wrapped around a part of the chicken. Um, so just enough to make it not get stuck somewhere. And then again, just, you know, hit it a couple times and there you are. So can you see the um, ingredients pretty, pretty well? Um, so I've just got my pot. Here is my master sauce that's been sitting in my freezer. I've had it for many years. Um, and because it's in the freezer, there's no time pressure as there is uh, with sourdough starter. It, is sometimes compared to sourdough starter in that it can be maintained for a long time. And I think some families pride themselves that they've had the same sauce for so long. Um, but I have destroyed sourdough starters by forgetting or failing to use them, but this just sits in your freezer and it's fine. Um, I don't know how well you can see it, but it's kind of gelatinous. It's, it's completely thawed, but I've used it so many times uh, that it's it's just got that kind of substantial feeling that uh, anything that has lots of kind of chicken essence in it will acquire. So I'm just putting all my sauce in the pot. And if you are starting from scratch, you just sort of go through this this list. I have said one and three quarter cups of good quality soy sauce that good quality is important because it's a huge amount of soy sauce uh, and i 
I think it's over. I don't even know what to do with most of the brands I see if I go to a, a Chinese grocery store. There are just so many choices. Um, I've tried to write this recipe for Amanda asks, what is good quality? Yeah, um, I would say by and large, avoid a, a soy sauce that contains hydrolyzed anything. I think it's hydrolyzed soy protein or something that I, as I use sometimes see on the label or a caramel color, because really the, um, the ingredients should be pretty simple. I think they should be something like soybeans, water, salt, or something like that. I'm just gonna look. Um, I said that Kikoman is good because you can find it at just about anywhere. Um, yes. Question about naming a brand. So I, I say Kikoman because it's widely available. Uh, but I know that there are people here who have experience with lots of other brands who might also, if you want to put a recommendation in the chat, that would be great too. Um, I can talk to you a little bit more about soy sauce later if you like. Um, but anyway, go ahead and put your one and three quarters cups of soy sauce into your pot. Uh, um, there's a sorry. There's a question. If they if they're a half a half a cup short on soy sauce, is that okay? Or like that's fine. Yeah, it's really flexible. Um, maybe. Um, I was gonna say, do they need to reduce the water? I actually don't think they do. I I looked at, I don't know, eight recipes uh, just to kind of see what uh, all the different books say, and the proportions are all over the place. And I think it's because, in the end, it becomes kind of a sauce you put on your own bowl of rice. So if it's really salty, you're just going to use less of it. And if it's you know milder, you'll just use more of it. So it, it's pretty easy you know, to proceed with confidence. Um, great. Okay, so yeah, Stacy says tamari. Yeah, I think that that's great. And then someone mentioned fish sauce, I think, in the chat. I'm sort of far from my computer. Um, Oh, Rita, lower sodium soy sauce. You know, I have bought the lower sodium Kikoman and I found it to be fine. Um, some books say soy sauce is basically salt. So if you want it to be less sodium, just use less of it. Um, but I think that's kind of oversimplifying. I think it's fine. I mean, in the end, it's gonna be sort of your, your taste and you can adjust your sauce as, as you get used to it. Um, so I'm gonna put in my soy sauce. Soy sauce. I've only, I'm only doing a third of that one and three quarters because I'm doing the refreshment. Um, and then similarly, the recipe says to put in about a quarter cup sherry. That amount fluctuates wildly across the books as well. But go ahead and put in your quarter cup. I'm putting in, you know, tablespoon and a little. Um, and I can talk to you about sherry as well because I think I wrote on the recipe sherry or rice wine. Uh, a lot of recipes will ask you to use Shaoxing wine. Consider sherry, can you use Chinese? Yes, you can. Uh, and I have lined up a few bottles of uh, various wines that you can use, all pretty much undrinkable. Uh, but I, what part of what I did in writing Peach State was to spend a lot of time with old Chinese cookbooks written for an American audience. And there was no way you could get Shaoxing wine in most parts of the US when these books were coming out. So they all just said dry sherry, cheap dry sherry, uh, like the $4 sherry you know, is, is perfect for this. Um, let's see. So just drop in your three slices of ginger. I'm doing one. Drop in your scallion. I guess I'm putting in a whole scallion, even though I'm you know, not doing the full uh, start. And then, Fer, um, could you prep me a star X? I just didn't put it in my plate from here. And 
and then I wrote a recipe that dried tangerine peel is a good thing to put in, and that's also something you can get in a Chinese grocery. Um, I think it's on the bottom shelf after the pepper. Um, and so this this tangerine peel has a really strong smell, but I have it it, it lends this nice dimension. But it's and yeah, it's tangerine. So if you don't have it, um, I think there's nothing wrong with putting a, some fresh orange peel or tangerine peel in. Whatever you have, it's really flexible. So I'm dropping that in. Um, if you like the the sort of anise flavor of fennel or star anise, um, it says to put one in, and you don't have to. Some people don't like that flavor but we do, so <laughs> I'm putting one in. And then a cinnamon stick. So just drop that in. And then sugar or rock, Chinese rock sugar. So I don't have any Chinese rock sugar. And the reason is mainly that lately I've only been able to find the kind that's in nice evenly shaped little chunks, which is much more convenient than buying the kind of real thing, which is often huge, and you have to take a mallet to it, and then it just goes everywhere. Um, but those little chunks, when I look at the sort of way it's made, it's basically candy. You might as well just use sugar. So I have just kind of done without because I haven't seen the big chunks, and I also find them kind of hard to deal with. But I do like them, so probably next time I encounter them, I will buy them and force myself to smash them sometime. So anyway, go ahead and add your sugar. So we've added, I think, everything but the water now for your sauce, right? Anything missing in here I forgot? I think that was it. Um, I'm just adding one cup of water. Question, do they taste different than, yeah, I mean, there's, it's hard to describe, and one way to get a little closer to the taste might be light brown sugar. Um, I think, no, it's, like if you gave me a master sauce chicken with made with white sugar and another one made with rock sugar, I don't, I don't think I'd be able to tell. Um, so I don't know, but I know there are people here who use rock sugar who can tell things. So feel free also to uh, weigh in if you know. So I'm going to add my one cup of water. Go ahead and add your three cups of water. And I'm just going to grab a wooden spoon right now. Okay. So I'm just generally combining it. You just try to get the your sugar off the bottom of the pot. And then this is where we put the chicken in. Is this chicken from the college farm? I know the farm isn't really doing chickens officially, right? Maddie, do you? I, I would just that's a that's a Jen question. I know she's in here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can answer no that those that chicken is raised by Will Nelson, the vegetable production manager. He and his family raise broilers every oh, year. Oh, that's so yeah. nice. I mean, I could tell it was a fantastic chicken. No, I just oh. was curious about like where you got it. Um, yep. So, oh, thank you for that. If you can see it, it just has this really like I don't know what is it. it just looks healthy. <laughs> I don't know. This is not a very professional way to describe it, but anyway. So you just ease the chicken into the liquid. And you know, also be cautious if you're not sure about the dimensions of your pot, make sure it's not gonna overflow. Um, you know, I've just, I'm so used to this that I pretty much know what my pot needs. So I'm gonna go wash chicken juice off my hands. I'll be right back. So. Hey, did any did anything come up in the 
um oh marty yes we removed the um uh, there, there just weren't any giblets or anything in mine but yeah do take them out um and I, I mean, sometimes I'm tempted to just kind of cook them in the sauce, but I, I also wonder if they will lend a strong flavor that you may not want in your future sauce. So uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with just cooking them briefly and then taking them out of, of, the, of the sauce. But if you don't want that interference, you don't want a sort of liver dimension in your, in your sauce, then maybe do something else with it. Um, my dog likes it when I get a lot of extra pieces in a chicken. Um, so yeah, good question. All right, so I'm just taking this over to the stove. And maybe the, yeah, sure, let's see if we can. I see a question in the chat. Can you use yeah. chicken pieces? Oh, um, I think you can. I think you might want to just cook it for a shorter time. Um, because the recipe is so simple, I've never even tried that, but I don't see why you couldn't use pieces. Uh, so at this point, really all you're doing is bringing it to a boil and occasionally just kind of spooning the liquid over the part of the bird that is um, not submerged. I don't know if you can see it, maybe you can, but um, I've got it so that it gets mostly submerged and that's fine, it'll still cook. But it helps to baste it uh, and later you'll turn it over. Um, and right now it's, it's you know, just totally cold, so it really makes little difference, but I'm just getting that on there. How many quarts is that pot that you're using? My pot is four liters, so it's four and a quarter quarts. And it's a really, it's a heavy pot. I mean, I, I longed for a pot like this for a long time. When I finally got it, I was, I mean, it has really um, been a workhorse. The heavy pot just helps it retain more heat when it's sitting because it sits for a pretty long time at the end. But it doesn't matter if you use just an ordinary pot. I'm also going to turn on the, um, I, I have a, a pot of water, like, like a, as if for pasta, just sitting here already. That's going to be for the spinach. You can start that kind of water if you like. Let's see. Must my chicken be completely submerged? No. Um, a little of, a little of it can stick out um, because we're going to cover it once it comes to a boil and simmer it with the lid on. And also every now and then uh, baste and then later we'll turn it over so that um, every part of the chicken will cook in the liquid for long enough. Let's see, we are at the point where there's kind of nothing to do but wait for it to uh, heat up. Uh, but maybe I can, if any questions, I, I can't always see the chat that well. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna come back over here because I think it's a little bit easier. I think, I think you got all the ones in the chat right now, but I welcome any other questions. Oh, how about a poem? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. Um, all right. I thought maybe a good poem to read um, in relation to all of this is, where's the book? Okay. Um, I have the book that I've been waiting for. Uh, the poem is called Serve Immediately. You know that I don't like that. And um, I'm sure others do not either. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't always dislike it, but you know, it can drive you a little crazy. So I'll read, serve immediately. The techniques evolved reasonably out of cooking fuel scarcity. But if one more recipe ends with the phrase, I'm throwing out the book, 
Already the days overflow with imperatives. If I weren't so hungry, I'd be reading, sleeping, or burning energy at the gym where exertion is meant to result in replenishment. My appetite is less for calories than for forms that live in obscurity most of the year, assembled in albums my grandfather made, thousands of restaurant tables, before documenting meals became fashionable. In the moment, we sometimes grumbled. How many fish needed to be immortalized, glistening on platters, one eye admiring the chandelier, one side adorned with scallions and ginger. Now I go in search of the not yet filleted. The authors demand that I shop each day, quizzing the fish man, seeking out chickens still warm from the kill and simulate kitchens teeming with servants, aunts, grandmothers. The original second person narrators they preach the ancient urgency of staying ahead of rot, thus the pantry, salted, pickled, fermented, dried, able to withstand neglect and survive the months until I finally come back from Tetrazzini and Chili Mac, embracing the tyranny of generations who have departed but left instructions. Thank you. Um, Lots of silent oh, snapping and clapping. <laughs> Thank you. Kind of far away, but I appreciate those. This is great. So. Thank you. I'm still a little far from my screen to be able to read, but I really like this. Um, Oh, just praise <laughs> after praise. Love the ending. Transcendent. Ah, so good. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, do you want to talk at all about? I, I brought some, some like bottles of soy sauce and cooking wine and stuff just to kind of give you a little bit of information about. Um, I think that would be great. I think people were curious about the soy sauces. And yeah. The so I'm just going to put these three in a row. I know there are Chinese cooking experts in this room. So tell me if I've got something um, inaccurate. But um, the soy sauce that you use the most is just the regular soy sauce. Um, there's cucumber here. I use other brands. Um, I've yeah, sometimes used tamari. OK, I don't. They're not exactly interchangeable, but I think they they can kind of you know, sub in for each other like quite often. And um, you'll see recipes that call for light soy sauce sometimes. And one of the options in this recipe is to substitute a little bit of light soy sauce for some of the sort of regular soy sauce in your um, master sauce. And I like doing that sometimes. You know, maybe. If I were starting from scratch, I might do one and maybe one and a half of regular and then a quarter cup of light. Light is a maybe sometimes misleading word because it sounds like a kind of maybe lower sodium, healthy version of soy sauce, but it's actually saltier. Um, and so just know that. I think we used to have a label um, my mom's here. We might have even had a label on our light soy sauce that said, warning, very salty, just so that we wouldn't forget and, and like treat it like regular. Um, but it is, I think, thinner and so it's, and maybe lighter in color. So that makes it, let's see, what's the story with it? I don't know what the story with liquid aminos is. Does somebody else know? Um, well, meanwhile, sometimes you'll see recipes asking for dark soy sauce. And that's really confusing to me sometimes because I don't know whether they mean like not light as in regular or do they mean dark soy sauce? Um, this one calls itself black soy sauce, which I think is sometimes an interchangeable name for 
for dark and it's uh, it's thick really dark and a little bit sweet so it has its own usefulness but i think the terms light and dark can can sometimes be confusing so anyway that's the soy sauce um, kind of general suggestion. And I'm just going to go like base a little. Maybe I can bring the computer over. So we're back here with our, our chicken and like it's starting to, to be warmed up. The um, the sauce is no longer looking like jello. I love that you don't have to do very much to it. And let's see, if you haven't washed your spinach, this could be a good time to do it. I pre-washed mine so everybody wouldn't have to endure me filling bowl after bowl with water. Um, but what I like to do is get a really large bowl, fill it with cold water, drop the spinach in, swish it around. In the winter, the water is sometimes so cold that I swish it with a wooden spoon instead of having to put my hands in it. And then just lift it out into a colander sort of the way you would wash salad greens, just so that the, the sand sinks to the bottom. And I usually do that a few times until there's no, until I can't see anything sort of falling to the bottom of the water. So, uh, I'm just gonna see if my spinach water will it has. I mean, the, the spinach recipe is so easy as well. There's not there's not a lot to it, but that's what I like about these about these dishes that you don't have to do a lot. Um, let's see. So you already have your spinach water boiling, then? Yeah, I mean, I kind of like it's it's so quick that it really doesn't matter when you do it. Um, I put it on. I think I turned the stove on under that water when I was putting the chicken on the stove. And I like to, I mean, some, sometimes you'll see recommendations to just wilt your spinach directly in the pot, and you can certainly do that. I find that sometimes spinach does that thing to your teeth. I mean, do people have that, I don't, I don't know what it's called, but that weird kind of feeling in your teeth that you sometimes get from spinach. Is anybody connecting to that? I, I find that if you drop it in a lot of water, um, a sort of grit, absolutely. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. um, so but, I, but I find if you cook it like pasta, only much shorter, then that feeling doesn't happen to your teeth. And this is Dickinson spinach. It's probably not like I found that a lot of the Dickinson produce is so good that I don't have the same issues with it that I would with um, maybe something from the grocery store. But I, like I just don't want to ruin my spinach by getting the tooth thing. <laughs> so yeah, um, that's that's why I do this. Uh, but if it doesn't. If that sort of thing doesn't bother you, I think you could probably skip that step and just wilt it. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, here's something else I haven't realized. I have a lot of cookbooks um, and a fairly good size subset of Chinese cookbooks, but I had no idea that I had so many recipes for master sauce chicken. I don't really follow anyone in particular when I make it, I just kind of, read two or three recipes and then just kind of build that template in my head and proceed. But um, thanks to this event, I was forced to actually write down what I do. <laughs> that, that's good. Now I don't have to think about it next time. Uh, but what I did also as part of that was to uh, see how many of my books had master sauce chicken recipes in them. And of course, what I discovered was that I had far more than I knew. 
because it has so many different names. And this is something that happens, I think, with any uh, any country's food that emigrates. So you know, it comes goes from a Chinese speaking country to an English speaking country, and all of a sudden, nobody knows what it's called because it has six different names depending on where you are. Uh, so I realized that one book I have had something in it called soy sauce chicken, which I never even wanted to give a chance because it sounded like nothing. But it turns out that that was a master sauce chicken recipe. And then I have another book that calls it flavor potted chicken. Another thing where I just kind of looked at that and blanked and thought, what's flavor? I've never heard of flavor potting. And so um, that was master sauce chicken. And then just tonight, I found another book that calls it thousand year sauce chicken. Um, and so they're all the same thing. Oh, now my uh, sauce has come to a boil. All right, so here we are. It's kind of going, going pretty lively. Uh, I don't really bother with skimming the foam. I don't, I don't know if some people really don't like the, the look of it, but I find that um, I don't mind. Uh, so at this point, I just put the lid on. Where's the lid? Turn the heat down, get it to a simmer, cover it, and then I'm going to set my timer for 20 minutes and that at the 20 minute point, I think I will baste again and turn the chicken over and I'll show you how I turn it over because it's kind of awkward. So setting the timer and meanwhile, has the water, spinach water hasn't boiled yet. But it's so flexible, it really kind of doesn't matter when, you, when that happens. Uh, so while that is doing its thing. Right over here, just because it seems like the surface. Um, would we, uh, oh, here's something else I can tell you about uh, sort of, maybe just sort of how I think about this dish, which is, when I get a, a, a whole chicken, I kind of feel like I've got this, it, it's kind of like having a notebook page. It's sort of like, oh, I have this opportunity to make something. What will I make? There are all kinds of possibilities. And I do often roast a chicken, uh, but Roasting a chicken is always a bit of a project, isn't it? You have this, this roasting pan, uh, you've got drippings that are sort of valuable, and I, I feel guilty if I don't do something with the drippings. Uh, after you eat the roast chicken, you've got this carcass that I feel really guilty throwing away, so I always feel like I have to make stock out of it. Um, and of course, when you're about to eat a roast chicken, it really would be nice to have some gravy, um, which also uses the drippings. But by the time you've done all that stuff, you've, you've used like five pans or, you, you know, you've, you've got your roasting pan, you might have a rack in it. Um, you have maybe another pan in which you've made your gravy and then you have the stock pot in which you've made stock and you get grease all over your colander from drain. Anyway, it's a big, it's a lot of, of effort. And sometimes I look at that chicken and I just think, you're a great chicken, but I want to deal with you. Um, master sauce chicken kind of is everything in one. You don't get the crispy skin, um, but you've kind of got your gravy already uh, right from the pot and you're under no pressure to make a separate stock because you've already sort of put that chicken essence into your master sauce, which is also kind of feeding your future gravy. Uh, and there was only one pot to wash. Uh, so, oh, and the other thing is that if it's summer, 
you don't really have to get your kitchen all hot. Uh, I, mean, I, I can't help thinking about things like how much energy you're using. I realize that it's not really a problem in the time and place where we live. I, mean, I don't think we worry that using the oven is going to be really costly versus using the stovetop. Uh, but in sort of real terms, it is, right? You're just using a lot more energy to surround a, a, a bird with heat in a sort of hot chamber than having it in a pot on the stove. Uh, so sometimes I think about that just from a sort of sustainability angle. Um, I never really see any difference in my gas bill. <laughs> it's not that, it, it's more just kind of thinking about economy. Uh, and I think that's also one of the reasons I think so much about cooking and poetry in the same ways. You know, poetry has, can be done with so many constraints that can make you maybe more resourceful than if you didn't have them. I think it's time to put the spinach in the pot. So back over here and let's see. I, I think I saw a question come up from Andrea. Well, I'm going to just get something. It's a question about making two chickens, um, doubling oh. the sauce, uh -huh. uh, bigger pot. Can you cook them both together? Questions like that. Oh, I mean, just based on this, the average shape of a chicken, it might, like you might not need as much sauce if you used two pots. But if you, I feel like there are some really nice oval pots that you might be able to nestle two chickens in nicely. Like, I think it would just be a matter of like how your, how your cookware um, compares to your chickens. Uh, but yeah, if, I mean, if, but if you do two all the time, then maybe like, maybe we'll come up with a system. So, all right. So just dropping the spinach in the water. And this is not supposed to be for very long at all. Again, amazing Dickinson Farm produce. Oh, I'm dropping them. Drop the leaf. Okay. Where did I put my spoon? And I really don't want this here for long at all. Really, just as long as it takes to wilt all of it. Also kind of depends on your spinach you know if you have for instance i wouldn't i probably wouldn't do this to baby spinach um but if you have like a a bag from the grocery store of spinach where the stems and the leaves are really big um and you might do this for just a little bit longer but still not too long um a minute two minutes at most okay and here we are getting ready to can you, i don't know what you can see <laughs> Alright, so just drain it all right away. <laughs> this is really fun, actually. <laughs> Alright, so I just sort of leave it because we're not under any time pressure here, I just kind of let it drip for a while um, so that some of the excess water will come out, maybe shake it a bit. And because I happen to think of it, I'm gonna baste the chicken. It's one of those things where, you know, do it when you think about it, but if you don't do it very often, it's still gonna be fine. Um, and this is actually the, the this is a good time to check the, how the simmer is going. Like I feel like my simmer was a, was a little bit too low, so I just 
want to get it bubbling around the edges. How's it going, those of you who are cooking? Let's see. <laughs> oh, was that Andrea? I think that was, that was Amy. Oh, asking about the, cook, the Yeah, that was pretty, pretty swanky. I was going to ask about it too. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll show it to you again and I'll tell you. Okay. So yeah, it's, it has these arms that extend to fit your sink so that it um, rests over the sink because I'm sure you've noticed that when you put a colander in your sink at the bottom, like the drain can't keep up. And sometimes the water you're trying to drain off kind of like comes back up and then whatever was in your drain is now in your food. Like I just find that that's stressful. And uh, I don't remember where I got this. Uh, the one I have is actually, I've been kind of getting, looking for an excuse to replace it because I mean, it's, it's great but the, um, the rim is getting to be a little bit separate from the, uh, the, the sort of sieve part. And so a piece of orzo will get caught in there. You know, and like, so it's not that big a problem. I've just found ways to deal with that. Um, but it's one of those things where, you know, if there weren't something else I wanted more, maybe I would get a new one where it was sealed to the To that edge but it is nice i use it all the time and sometimes i will use it for something small and use it to i'll show you let's pretend there's no spinach in it um rest some like rest a smaller um thing in it Sim and simply use the big one to hold the small one in place um once again so that you know you have only two hands. So it's, so you're picking up a pot full of something. Um, you need some gadget to hold your strainer in place. Okay, so um, maybe, oh, maybe a moment to talk about rice. Uh, what kind of rice, those of you who are cooking, what, what rice are you cooking and what are you cooking it in? Does, pot. Hey, Julia, pot. So like a pot on the stove, right? That's one way. Um, I'm curious if anyone has any of those fancy pressure cooker things. Oh, someone, someone did make it in their instant pot. Oh, there's Julia. Hi, 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 Julia
and I was just miffed. Really, I mean, how come I'm still alive? You know, it's like if you are a person who eats Chinese food just kind of as part of your life, and just part, it's what may not be your main thing, but you're going to eat more than that. So anyway, it took me many, many years to get the poem to work, but here it is. It has a long title. It's called on the recommendation that American adults consume no more than one quarter cup of rice twice a week. The rice plant drinks up arsenic, so show good sense and change your diet. Studies reveal where fields were cotton, southern states, more contamination. If your word for food is your word for rice, change your word for food or rice. Deem it a side dish, you can will it. Learn to love barley, amaranth, millet. Your grandmother in the nursing home sacrificed the foods of home in exchange for shelter. You can too. If rice was your child's first solid food, serve quinoa next, then polenta, grits. Teach your rice cooker novel tricks. Mapa dofu may be strange and vulgar, but your parents always adapted dinner. If ghosts were going to wipe their brows in heaven, they would have done it by now. Thank you so much. So I eat rice freely, but I rinse it. Um, I mean, I wash it pretty, like I submerge it in a lot of water, swish it around, uh, pour that water off, add more water, swish it around. Um, maybe it's superstitious. I, I have this, this idea that I should do that six times. And that takes a lot of arsenic out. Um, and also there are lots of uh, sources of information on, on sort of where your white rice was grown that will, it, it does make a difference and you can sort of seek out lower arsenic sources. Um, so let's do the spinach. I, I realized that might be getting hungry. Um, where did I put my cutting board? So the spinach, again, it, it's super straightforward. I have a friend who finds, oh, I like that. Rinsing rice as meditation. Yeah. It's got that, that sort of sound effect too that's probably kind of comforting. Okay, so I'm gonna get that spinach, I think enough of the water has gone out of it now. That was my rice cooker. Um, it's just finished cooking twice. <laughs> failed to introduce Dervla, my daughter, who's been sort of helping me like she went to get things I forgot that she's here. <laughs> I'm sure I'll drop something or need your help again. Okay, so I put the spinach in a big bowl um, and then really all you do is mix in the other things on that recipe. So a, a scallion uh, chopped fairly small. Um, and then, what did I say? Did I say a tablespoon and a half of, where did I put that soy sauce in? Just find the recipe I have it here. Um, one and a half tablespoons of soy sauce. This is for a pound of spinach, so if you have a smaller, Quantity obviously just adjust. And a half teaspoon sugar. There's sugar in both of these recipes, and that's I have a poem about that too. Um, sugar, a tablespoon of rice vinegar. 
And this is another shopping tip. Often in stores, you will see um, this brand of rice vinegar, Maripan, and it'll, it'll be a green uh, label or like a green frame on the label. And there'll be another one that's kind of reddish orange. The green one is unseasoned. It's just rice vinegar. And that's the one I always buy. Uh, the other one I think has sugar and salt in it, which is fine. It's just that most of the recipes I use are, um, you know, asked for the unseasoned and then you control the amount of salt and sugar you add. And then some sesame seeds. So I sometimes have found, like I used to always just buy raw sesame seeds and then like toast them in a pan when I needed them. And then I just got so tired of doing that and found that you can buy pre-roasted ones. <laughs> Maybe they won't taste quite as, they don't have such a pop of, like compared to the uh, just roasted, but. I think we're all about real life and there's only so much time, isn't there? It is time to turn the chicken over. So let me do that and then we'll come back to the spinach. And then that's gonna be really all the instruction. But I will show you how I turn over a chicken in this sauce. First of all, I love to give it one more little base just because it seems like the right thing to do. And take a fairly wide wooden spoon and then another wooden spoon or a spatula. Um, and I take the wide one and I put it in the cavity. This is slightly, this is a delicate, this is such a, a sweet little chicken. Um, it's like the cavity is less big. Um, but once you get that spoon sort of into the cavity, it kind of presses against the sides of the chicken and then you can just kind of rotate the spoon and guide the chicken with your other utensil. Um, so it's just a little bit easier to, to turn than like some other maybe methods that one might be tempted to try. <laughs> so um, I don't know if basting is important at this point, but I just feel like So that was 20 minutes. Put the lid back on, simmer for another 20 minutes. And that's really all we need to um, I feel like need to demonstrate about the chicken because the rest of the recipe is just let it sit in the cooking liquid. Um, yeah, after you reach the 40 minute mark, just turn off the heat and do whatever you like for half an hour to two hours while the chicken just sort of soaks up that sauce. Um, and then when you're ready to eat, um, you know, take the chicken out. I think you can actually use that same method. Um, then you just strain the, the liquid that stays in the pan and use some of it as your sauce at the table. Um, there will be a lot of sauce and the remainder goes in the fridge or the freezer for your next chicken. Um, and I, I, I kind of think, well, you know, I, I now, when I eat, a, eat one of these chickens, I'm eating like a little bit of all the friends, um, meals. Uh, it just, I think, is a kind of layering of, of flavor. Um, I think one thing about being at Dickinson and having this connection to the farm is that I think we, we're, we're encouraged to think a lot about the cost of our food to the land, to, to as far as water, labor, and all those things. And, and I like trying to use everything. So, bye Rita. <laughs> um, and that's 
I feel like this is one recipe that, that does that. So now I'm just gonna add my uh, sesame seeds to the, the spinach. I just left my uh, measuring utensils over there. So I'm just gonna you know, eyeball it. I think I put about two tablespoons. And then just mix it well because sometimes I think the, the sauce gets caught in certain areas because of the, or the seasoning get caught in you know, a clump of spinach leaves. So just get it good. And then, you know, it's a lot smaller than when we started. So I like to then serve it in something not quite as big as that mixing bowl. Uh, so you're then really flexible because you can serve the spinach warm, you can serve it room temperature, uh, you can chill it and eat it as a chill side. Um, so you can live your life uh, while your chicken just sits there, your spinach just sits there, and your rice cooker or your instant pot deals with your rice. So that is the, that's the food, really. Um, any questions or concerns while anybody is proceeding? One more poem, Marnie. Sure, thank you for asking. <laughs> okay. Um, in fact, I, I think I mentioned a minute ago something about, okay. Um, oh, right. I mentioned that there was sugar in both of these recipes. Uh, and so there's a poem in, in Peach State that I think I have been trying to write this poem for a long time too. That rice poem took a long time, trying, trying to get it right. Oh, Amy, yes. Question about how to carve the chicken. Um, oh, after the poem? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll read the poem and then I'll talk to you about serving the chicken. Um, so I read and I was reading all about food while I was working on this collection. And one of the things that came up was that sweet and savory were really not that separate in most cultures around the world. You know, we have, the, I think, this Western idea that you eat savory food for the meal and then you eat a sugary dessert and you know everybody who um, grows up in this country I think knows you know the parents telling the kids don't eat dessert yet you're going to spoil your appetite you have to like wait on the sweets um, and apparently you know, it turns out that it wasn't always that way um, even in Europe the sweet and savory just kind of worked together uh, as it as it does in many countries around the world. Um, and you often see small amounts of sugar in, in Chinese dishes, as we just did. Um, I, and I don't remember who this was, but there was a French, um, I don't know, culinary historian, chef, I don't know who, who kind of codified everything and wrote down you know, that you should not mix sweet and savory. And that sort of became the rule because somebody had written it down and somehow got disseminated. And anyway, uh, I, I had always wanted to sort of get this into a poem. The poem is called Savory versus Sweet. It isn't the marriage that maps your course, only the divorce. One house has become all penance, the other indulgence. You struggle to resist what has grown to feel illicit, an appetite threatening obsession for delectation. What grows on trees tastes unfinished, an imitation of artifice. What court determined that sweetness be earned? Some chef with too much power once called mixing salt and sugar a form of barbarism. His decree like any fashion, should have evaporated. But someone recorded it, so centuries, a continent away, 
your whole body hesitates to sweeten even slightly chicken soup or broccoli. There's enough complication in houses and nations. His laws are as good as blue. The offender isn't you. Thank you. Another great one. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I'll address Amy's question about serving the, the chicken. Thank you, Marty. Uh, it's, it comes out a little bit falling apart. I mean, the, you can, uh, thank you, um, Amy, too. Uh, you can carve it. You could just put it on a platter and carve it like roast chicken, but like the pieces kind of tumble off in a way that a roast chicken doesn't break apart. Uh, do you need to let it rest? No, you don't. Um, but I also think maybe it's because when you let it rest after roasting, the juices are kind of recirculating, but this has been cooked in liquid, so that kind of isn't an issue. Uh, so, but I, I don't really do it that way. I tend not to do it the traditional Chinese way either because I'm just no good at it, like cutting through the bone. You know how when you go to a Chinese barbecue place and you get a duck or a roast chicken, um, like they, they just hack it all up in 20 seconds and they just cut cleanly through all the bones. Uh, and that, you know, that is probably the most flavorful way to eat it. Um, but I'm just no good at it. I find that the bones splinter and, or I just can't do it evenly and it's just not, <laughs> not worth the trouble. Um, so I either just kind of rip it apart and I kind of just pull it off as you go. It's kind of falling apart anyway method. Or um, if you want it to look more elegant, you can bone the whole thing and just sort of reassemble pieces on the platter um, you can even sort of keep the you know, legs where they would have appeared and the breast pieces in the center and you could slice them. And that's where the um, cilantro garnish comes in. Um, and also a little bit of sesame oil. Oh, and that's another ingredient thing. I said in the recipe sesame oil and I think most people will know that I mean this sort of dark toasted sesame oil, uh, but and I think even the Carlisle Giant has it now, but there was some time maybe earlier in my time in Carlisle and I couldn't get to an Asian grocery store and I had run out of sesame oil and I was going up and down the aisles of Giant. And finally, I, like somebody just asked me, what are you looking for? <laughs> um, she pointed me to sesame oil and it was indeed sesame oil, but it was like cold pressed. It was very light and it didn't have, it just wasn't, the same, just didn't have that fragrance that the dark has. Uh, so just a, a shopping note to look for the, the really dark toasted oil. I think there's another logistical question about how to tell if the chicken is fully cooked through. Uh -huh. I think it actually has been fully cooked for a while. There is another recipe that I used to do a lot and I, I don't know why, you know how you kind of just wander away from a recipe for a while, where it's called white cut chicken. And I know that some of you here have made it. <laughs> um, basically, you, there's not a dark sauce. You are cooking a chicken just in water with ginger and scallions. And um, I can't remember whether you bring the water to a boil before you put the chicken in or probably not. You, uh, I'll have to check on that. But basically you bring that to a boil, put the lid on, keep it at a lively simmer for 10 minutes, turn off the stove and wait half an hour and it's done. Um, never take off the lid <laughs> because it's the, the, the retaining of that heat that cooks it as well as the water. But I found that to be foolproof. The chicken is always done. So the fact that we have been simmering this chicken now for 30 minutes and there are 10 minutes to go, and then it's gonna sit in that hot liquid for at least half an hour afterwards, I found that it's always done. Um, sometimes I even worry that I'm overdoing it. Uh, one thing to of course be sure of is that your chicken isn't partially frozen when you start. That will obviously set it back. So uh, make sure if you, if you 
chicken is frozen, it's fully thawed before you smell it. Um, and if in doubt, of course, you can always um, use a, a meat thermometer. I think 175 is the um, safety point for the thighs. Is that right? Anybody want to confirm so that I'm <laughs> not giving that information? I mean, that's what I look for. Okay, 165 for the breast meat. So a little higher for the leg meat, probably. It's thicker. Yeah, yeah, Melissa, I, I'm with you. Um, so I think as long as, you know, if you want to be really sure, that's a good way to double check. All right, well, I think we're, I think we're done. Um, Unless anyone has a question. I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Thank you so much, Professor Sue, for um, sharing your cooking wisdom and poetic wisdom about food, all of the that good stuff. I think I definitely enjoyed it. And there was even a comment of someone who made the made the dish last night and it was so good. She wanted to make, you know, two chickens at once. So um, I hope everyone enjoys um, what 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 they've made after this class. Um, I thank you for everyone who came to this class and being so respectful with the with the zoom. Um, we have a couple more we have like five more classes I think um, this semester the next class is a um, the multicultural cooking class led by um, Nidra Werner from the library at Dickinson College. And she's going to be demonstrating how to make flan and flan, excuse me, and um, I think a Korean cucumber salad. So that should be fun. Um, and then also, I know you mentioned sourdough starters earlier in this class. It just so happens that after or in March we have a class with um, Antia Fangkuken, who is in this in in this. Uh, oh, maybe she just left. Ah, oh, there she is. Uh, she's in this Zoom call. Um, and she will be showing, uh, teaching how to make um, sourdough bread. Um, so maybe she can have some tips on keeping the, the sourdough starter alive. Um, all of these can be found on Facebook. Um, I think that's the easiest way to find the information, the Dickinson College Farm, put that in Facebook. You can find us in the cooking classes. I normally put up the like event information two to three weeks before, before the event. Um, with lots of updates, but thank you again, Professor Sue. I'll put the link for your pre-order on your book of lovely poetry in the chat again. Um, yeah, if you had any any closing, word. oh, the events are also on Engage. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for all these really nice remarks in the chat. And, um, yeah, really nice to do this with all of you and uh, yeah, I hope that you enjoy your meal if you were cooking along. <laughs>